So a lovely expectant hush. So welcome everybody. I'm Professor Susan Ray. I'm a scientist, a medical scientist, but I'm also the University of Liverpool's director of Athena Swan, and that's all about gender equality. And I never knew I was so popular. Thank you. <laughs> Of course, we are here to hear from Professor Mary Beard, who later today is receiving an honorary degree from our university, so I'm highly delighted that she's here, but also that she accepted our invitation to get an honorary degree, because doing my homework, I came across a quote from Mary where she said um, she's rather ambivalent about collecting honours, and quote, getting dressed up in silly clothes is not my idea of fun. So I'm looking forward to seeing her later. Yeah. <laughs> but it was very generous of you indeed to accept the invitation. And um, as you know, Mary has kindly agreed to answer some questions from us, which have packaged as fame, academe, and gender. And that's certainly a rich scene to, to mine, I think. I can say with confidence, because I've looked it up on Wikipedia, that Mary was uh, born in Shropshire, and that's where she was schooled, uh, before going up to uh, Cambridge, where she studied classics, as I'm sure almost everybody knows. She spent a few years at King's College London before returning to New Newnham College, Cambridge, as a fellow, and uh, joining the faculty of the classics department there, where she has stayed for many a year, getting her chair, her professorship there in 2004. She has made, um, uh, she has a second professorial title, which I think is from the Royal Academy of Arts. Yes, she's their professor of ancient literature. <laughs> she's the classics editor um, for the Times Literary Supplement and a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, Antiquaries, sorry, in 2005. And she was made in 2013 an OB. However, distinguished scholar as she is, I think most of us are here because also she has made a powerful impact as a communicator, a translator, if you will, of the classical world into our lives via our TV screens, and books. And uh, so, for example, she presented a documentary back in 2010 on a book that she'd written about Pompeii, uh, The Life of a Roman Town, in 2012. She had a series entitled Meet the Romans with Mary Beard. She's presented on Caligula. And this year, um, Mary Beard's Ultimate Rome, Empire Without Limit, was on our screens, so, uh, for which I thank you. Um, and, of course, all those programmes, as you know, have been imbued with her um, sense of passion, erudition, but also fun, um, which I'm a great believer in. And uh, it was just revelationary, the way she transformed what could be dull and dusty into the everyday life so that it was actually of not only interest to us, but it was so thought-provoking about the here and now. So Mary Beard, welcome to Liverpool, and thank you again. <laughs> I realise in my excitement I forgot to say if a fire alarm goes <laughs> off, it will be real. So run um, so in an orderly fashion, please, <laughs> please leave the building. We're not expecting one. Um, so yes, so that's I think the only housekeeping I had to do. So I'm going to uh, chat with, with Mary for about 25, 30 minutes, and then she's very happy to have questions from you, the audience, as well. So I hope that's what you were expecting. And I have my crib sheet here. So Mary, <laughs> um, could you... Feels like an exam. <laughs> <laughs> All over again. Uh, no, so uh, can you tell us something about how you think you became a classicist? What, you know, were the formative events in your childhood? Or why, why was it classics for you? Um, I've got a story, okay. and you never know with these stories. I mean, it's partly a bit of self mythologizing. <laughs> I, I believe it to be true, and it goes like this. <laughs> I was about five, and my mum decided that I should go and see London. 
had never been to the capital city. And it was quite educational trip she'd planned. Um, and we went to the British Museum. And two things happened in the British Museum. One was she took me to see um, the Elgin marbles um, from the Parthenon in Athens, 5th century BC. And I remember being absolutely amazed at them. I didn't have the foggiest clue really what mm. it was all about, but I'd kind of picked up the idea in a sort of very, very juvenile way that um, the further you went back in history, the worse people were at things, you know. They couldn't do <laughs> art, they couldn't write literature, you know. And the, so a wonderful Whig view of history. And here, 2,500 years ago, were a group of people doing things that were as good as anything we could do. And I, that sort of made an impact. But the other thing that made an impact was going, which I was rather more interested in then, to the Egyptians, because every kid is interested in mummies and things like that. Um, and we walked through the kind of everyday life in Egypt uh, show. And it, this was the British Museum in about 1960. And it wasn't child friendly. And, then, and <laughs> there was, in one case, there was a piece of carbonized Egyptian cake. And um, 3,000, 4,000 years old. And the case was quite high, and I couldn't really see it. Um, and my mum was kind of trying to lift me up so I could see this piece of Egyptian cake. <laughs> um, when a guy walked past, um, and he obviously saw what was going on, he got some keys out of his pocket, and he opened the case, and he got the cake out of the <laughs> case, and he showed it to me. Um, uh, and that was sort of ever so memorable, because it was, there was a sort of message there, actually. Um, you know, there was a message about people helping you, about the past being approachable, about museum cases opening up, if you were interested, that I think probably made as much difference to me as seeing the Elgin marbles. Yes. I ought to confess that a little bit later, fast forward about 10 years, and I got very keen on the ancient world through archaeology. Mm. And part of this was an extremely intellectual version of wanting to know about Rome and Britain. Part of it, I have to say, was the sheer pleasure of escaping one's parents <laughs> and going and camping on an archaeological dig with a pub down the road. And, you know, and there it was. Um, you know, it was a wonderful excuse. My parents thought that I was off doing very high-minded excavation. And indeed I was, but I was also doing other things in the evening. <laughs> yes. did, did it make you more... Um, Question when your own children said they wanted to go off on a <laughs> they, they never did. <laughs> no, I'm afraid they were rather more open about their transgressions. <laughs> so then, uh, as I said, you went to um, Newnham College, Cambridge, So, um, and I think we're much of a muchness in, in age. So apart from the sex, drugs and rock and roll, did you enjoy your time at Cambridge as an undergraduate? Yeah, I mean, I think that... You have to be pretty. You have to be pretty odd, um, yes. or have very, very bad luck not, mm. not not to enjoy your time as an undergraduate. I think yes. um, it was interesting in many ways. Um, kind of thought provoking. I've been at a, an all girls school. Um, I've been effectively an old, uh, only child of a half brother who's. Um, 15 years older than me, so effectively I was an only child. And I think before I went to Cambridge, uh, I only knew about discrimination against women in theory. You know, yeah. I hadn't actually <laughs> met it. Um, perhaps I've been very blind, but I hadn't met mm. it. You know, and I'd read Germaine Greer and things like that, so I had a kind of theoretical feminism. It wasn't until I went to Cambridge, you know, back in the early 70s, that I discovered there really were blokes who thought that women weren't as good. Mm. Um, and, I, and I say, I, I must have met people like that, but they'd, ne they'd never confessed <laughs> before. Um, and I remember, um, I, got, I, I remember it was also fellow students, really. I think that 
uh, I have a vivid recollection of a, a man who's now a great friend of mine still. <laughs> um, I, I remember him coming around to my college room and on the floor, because it was very messy, was one of my old essays. And my teacher had, had marked it and said, yes, this is, at the end, mm -hmm. so this is really very good, this is really, this is really first class work. And I remember this guy picking this up and saying, what, you, get a first. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, actually, the only reason mm -hmm. you think that's surprising yes. is because I'm female. Yeah. There's no other, you wouldn't say that to a bloke. No. And so, you know, I learned a bit more about the cutting edge of practical discrimination. Mm. Yes. Which is uh, a lesson worth learning early, perhaps. <laughs> you never know whether it, how early you should learn it. I mean, yes. in some ways, um, I, was very, I was very naked in the world, mm. in the discriminatory world mm. um, of, of kind of grown-up university. But the fact that I'd not met discrimination in that way before, not knowing, as I'd say, mm. I'm sure there were plenty of people in my hometown who thought a lot worse than these yes. guys in Cambridge did. Yes. But because it was, I, I'd been kind of sheltered from it, um, I think I was, I, I, I just found it very odd. I didn't find it, I didn't, it didn't mm. sap my confidence. No. I just thought, this is really odd. This is wrong. Yes. You know? yes. And I think that somehow, if I'd met that earlier, I, I, you know, I might have internalised those mm. ideas. I think it's very, you know, if somebody, if you get the message that you aren't as good, it's quite easy to start believing you're not as good. Yes. And I just thought, this is strange. Mm. Mm. And uh, looking back at it now, there's something very funny because, you know, I was reading Germaine Greer and Simone de Beauvoir, <laughs> you know, but that was all theory, yes. you know. I, yeah, and yes. so it was, as, it was as real or not real as the Romans were. <laughs> you know, and suddenly there was a world which this really Stop. was in your face. Okay, so um, apart from the slightly more serious questions, I do have some... Um, dafter questions and so my first one is what's your favorite type of gladiator <laughs> <laughs> i'm afraid i need to be a real downer oh here. go on <laughs> I, I i know and i can fully recommend if anybody really wants to go away and read about the different sorts of gladiator there were in the Roman world. There's the man with the net, the Retiarius. There's the Thracian with his big face mask. Um, and it, it's, it's always just gone over me, you know. I've just never, and I've come to the conclusion really that probably it's people in the 20th and 21st century who are really interested in gladiators. They're even more interested in gladiators than the Romans were. They don't actually do it, but you know, you look at, you go to the Colosseum now and you see, you know, and I've done this with my children, um, you know, you see kids paying, or their parents paying ridiculous amounts of money to have the kids' photographs taken with the, the, the thug who's dressed up as a gladiator <laughs> charging ridiculous amounts yes. of money. Um, yeah. And I think, so I, I try to rise above gladiators now. Absolutely. Although I tell you, you want to get, you want a good television programme, you know, gladiators, female gladiators. <laughs> yes. Or what do gladiators eat? You know, absolutely <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Okay, so um, one of the things that um, I'm interested in as a scientist is getting um, more women into um, science, both studying the sciences at school, but then come to this university and carrying on. I mean, in uh, the biomedical sciences, probably 50% of our undergraduates and probably postgraduates are female come to um, having the title of professor and we're down to the 10, 20 percent mark. Yes. So is that replicated in your world, Mary, of humanities? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there's a basic rule in, I think, I'm not just going to blame universities, there's a basic mm. rule in life that the higher you go up the tree, the fewer women you find, right? Yep. Um, now, I think you can be too gloomy about that. I mean, I think it's right to be gloomy, it's right to be cross. Um, 
But uh, the other thing that I suppose I think about this is that it really is getting better. You know? Mm. you know, improvements are being made. When I was an undergraduate at Cambridge, 12% um, of the undergraduates were female. Mm. And it's now almost 50%. That's in 40 years. Now, people often look, particularly at my university, many universities, and they say, <laughs> oh, they're really stuffy places, they're so conservative, they're absolutely not open to change, they're not having enough of, and then you name any disadvantaged group you like, and then you beat the university and say, there yeah. are a load of toffee dons who, mm. right. I have lived through a revolution yes. in, 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 my, in the institution that I spent most of my mm. time in. I, it used to be a boy's place with a few women in, and now it's a mixed institution at student level. Mm. And I think we've still got a lot to do. I think we're getting there. You know, the next level's up. I mean, I hope this isn't being too optimistic. And I say, one's, one's got to keep that sense of anger, otherwise you'll never change anything. Um, but for a long time, I well, no, for several years, I was the only woman on the faculty in my department. Yes. And now there's six or seven of us. Now, there's still six or seven out of 30, but again, you know, there, there, there is change. And, I mean, I think that there are, we should be thinking harder about how to make that change quicker. And I think things like, you know, what you're involved mm -hmm. with, initiatives mm -hmm. like Athena Swan, which are addressing gender issues in universities, are very important and they're very practical things that you can do. Um, uh, and that's all to be um, very much patted on the back. Thank you. Um, well done, <laughs> and I'm, I'm all waiting for it. it. But <laughs> I think in some way, there's, mm. there's, uh, why we're coming up against this is mm. because there's bigger things than practical. Yeah. I mean, that mm. what we've got to change is what's going on inside people's heads. You know, I think nurseries are really important. You know, for working mothers, absolutely really important. But the blockage is also mm. in still how we think about women uh, and uh, how we think the, the, the tasks in the world are divided or how we think characteristics a shared out. And I think you can spot it. I mean, one really ought to look very carefully at one's language because you, you think, if you, I mean, I think the best example here is the word ambitious. If you use it of a man, it's a compliment. A really ambitious young man, you know. Yes. Pat him on the back, you know. <laughs> if you say an ambitious woman, you yes. think you're a bit suspicious. Yes. And I think it's, I mean, so. I, I temper my optimism mm. and my sense that there's lots of things you can do practically to give this a push with a sense that actually inside people's heads there's a yet bigger job to be done. Mm. And I don't know how quickly you change that. I mean, you know, yes. language does change. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, just, you know, in, in my lifetime, um, I, I, I mean, I'm just thinking of... Um, gay politics. You know, in my lifetime, um, gay men were first of all called queer, and that was a definite insult. <laughs> then queer stopped, uh, and they became gay, um, <coughs> in such a way that my parents still never understood why people looked as Scots. <laughs> where they said, uh, very gay, a very yes, gay party. Yes. <laughs> all right. um, and now, um, Queer politics, mm. the word queer has been reappropriated as a badge of pride. Mm. Now, if you can do that, you know, we can do something about ambition and women and all the other things. So I think, you know, change is possible, um, but we have to remember it isn't only a practical change. I, I agree. fear. Yeah. I mean, it'd be easy if it was. We could just wave a magic wand, throw some money at it, um, <laughs> and have lots yes. more mentoring sessions and some day nurseries. <laughs> then we could do it. Yes. But um, there's yeah. more to be done than that. Yeah. So we have to keep that ambition and we have to keep that, um, that anger, grumpiness, whatever, yeah. that drive to... Um, but yeah. also and not letting get you down. Yes. You know, yes. I think that, you know, if, if you just... I mean, you know, people, undergraduates now, they, I often say, look, you know, when they're complaining about something, look, when I was an undergraduate, 12% of mm. the, the undergraduates at this university were women. 
And they look at absolute horror and they say, oh, it must have been terrible. It must have been absolute. You say, actually, it wasn't. You know, we had a good yes. time. You know, it is, you know, it's, it is yes. possible to have fun and to enjoy yourself yes. in a world that you see is imperfect. Yes. <laughs> Okay, that question number two. Oh, did you really translate one of David Beckham's tattoos? And did he thank you? Um, David Beckham didn't know. I, I made a, a rather um, perhaps unwise decision um, <laughs> to go and be one of the teachers on Jamie Oliver's dream school, which if you're over about 35, <laughs> you might possibly remember, it was a reality TV show, I think on Channel 4. And Jamie, who's a good lad, really, um, had decided he wanted to teach this group of disaffected failures at school. He wanted to teach them Latin. Um, and they said, if... Um, I didn't do it. They weren't going to have Latin. They didn't. So um, if I wanted Latin to be on this programme as Jamie wanted, I had to say yes. Now, my, the, <laughs> when I tell this story, I always make this, therefore, sound a great virtuous decision. You know, I'd say I was so anxious to go on to Jamie Oliver's dream school because it would bring Latin, not just to little kids that I was teaching, but to a wider group of people who would watch Jamie Oliver's dream school but would not watch a documentary about the Romans. So I said yes. <laughs> and, like, oh, and it was one of the most difficult <laughs> things <laughs> I've ever done. I mean, my mum was a teacher, you know, uh, and if, if there's one thing I learned, it was that teaching school kids is really, yes. really <laughs> hard, you know. Uh, and I think it's yes. harder when they're on the telly because, you know, no, you know if you go on a reality programme and you're a failed school child, you've got, you've got, you've got, you've got to, I think the deal was they've got no qualifications at 16. You know that the only way of using that to your advantage is to get a camera on you. You know, and the yes. only way to get the camera on you is not to sit there doing your work. <laughs> it's a real bloody nuisance, right? And so I found it very difficult, but I did realise, I, I think this was a part of success, that I would show them, you know, that Latin, you know, actually did turn up in all kinds of... Um, places they'd never expect, yes. like on David Beckham's tattoos, <laughs> several of which he had in Latin. And they were half interested. Yes. They were not. Maybe it had been on Victoria, but no. <laughs> Mixed group. Um, they were, the truth is, they were even more interested, to my surprise, in learning Roman numerals. And I, so we, we did, you know, V's and X's and ones, and they were wrapped, much more wrapped actually than by Jamie's, than by David Beckham's tattoos. And so after it, I said, why were you interested in that? Mm. You know, you sat, you know, Roman numbers, not my idea of fun. Yes. And they said, it's the only way that you can work out when a television programme's made. Because <laughs> at the end, the date comes up in Roman yes. numerals. Yes. I thought, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe to follow on from that, are you um, uh, despondent or doesn't really matter the number of um, scholars doing um, A levels in ancient Greek or even Latin in state schools? Does it matter? Are there other routes in, or is it actually bad news? Of course, it, it, it mm. matters, and it, mm. I think that um, I, I'm not a kind of Stalinist when it comes to Latin, and I don't think that you know, I'm not one of those people who says every school child should do Latin. It's an absolutely mm. ghastly thought, really. <laughs> um, what I do think is that those who get an opportunity to do Latin should not be filtered by wealth, right? Yes. And, uh, so, and, uh, and that's a, a, a big question. Now, you know, it is a bit like the discrimination question. It's, you know, you feel both optimistic and pessimistic and have fun all at the same time. Um, I think classicists, as a breed, are very nostalgic. Right. And they always think that, uh, you know, once upon a time, uh, the whole subject was much healthier. Uh, and this came home to me very, very uh, uh, forcibly when I was doing a bit of work on 
um, what the subject looked like in the late 19th, early 20th century, and I was going through mm -hmm. some archives. Mm -hmm. And this was the, the era that I thought was the heyday of classical culture and civilization education. And all these guys were sitting down saying, the subject is in terminal decline. Yes, you, know, yes. you know, not enough people are learning <laughs> Latin, you know, and we're not teaching it yes. right. And they don't know their grammar, all this kind of stuff. And I thought, ah, oh, oh, right, this is actually, this is something about the subject. You know, the subject has kind of constructed itself probably since about the second century AD, as always looking back to a golden age when people did it better and more people did it. So, so I think that's important. I think that in my lifetime, really, my working lifetime, there have been huge initiatives which have been successful of um, uh, supporting classics in state schools, of reintroducing mm. classics into state schools, of using classical civilization as a subject to get people interested, teaching Latin from scratch at university. So, you know, I can do quite mm. a, you know, an optimistic um, uh, reading. And I do like to say that there are now more people doing Latin at my university than ever in the past. Then, ever. Now, the proportion is rather smaller, <laughs> you know, because in the late 19th century there wasn't much yes. else you could do. So, you know, and now they're all doing science, yes. right? Yes. Um, but in raw numbers, mm. you know, and that's yes. not bad. No, no. I just wonder if you had any influence on that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I, you know. I think cl classical, um, the classical community. Um, are, are very, very committed to mm. access, to proselytising, to joining up, not having, you know, rather grand professors going to schools, you know, where they, yes. they you know, impart a bit of information and go away again, um, but actually joining up, having a joint project with teachers at all mm. levels. Mm. Um, and it's certainly, you know, people do tend to say, oh gosh, you know, you do such a lot, all my colleagues. Um, you know, they do more of the unglamorous yes. side. Yes. You know. Being yes. on telly is, is one way. I think it's an important way of doing it. But um, at the cold face, I can't think of a single colleague who doesn't mm. Um, mm. really put themselves out to do that. And they don't get, they don't com they don't get complimented on it as often as I do. Yes. <laughs> Fair enough. So, um, I mean... Again, just following on from that, um, certainly in the scientific world, uh, as academics, we have a lot of pressure now, more pressure, um, about what's the impact of your work? What's the impact? And um, I sometimes feel for the uh, younger academics that not only do they have to prove themselves in their subject, but they have to be out, as you say, proselytizing about the subject, going into schools, demonstrating the impact all within five years yes. or so. And, and yeah. you just think, no. Yeah. Um, the, number of grant, comments. the number of grant applications for you know, working yeah. on very nice things like Greek tragedy, that you see the end says, and then I plan to make a television series, because <laughs> yes. yes. I know they've got to press the impact yes. button. Yes. Yeah. Now, I, think, I think two things about it, really. <laughs> I mean, one is it's a horrible governmental imposed world, um, which is just trying to put poor old suffering, overworked mm. academics through another hoop. Yes. Um, and also to make them compete with one another. My impact was greater than your impact. You know? well, no, it wasn't. You know, no, it wasn't. You know? And uh, you know, the matrix. Yes. You know, I've got a website that's got five million hits you know, in a week, you know, right? And all this kind of stuff. And you know, oh, yeah. blimey. Yes. Um, you know, underneath, it's. You know, the initiative, the overall impetus isn't bad. I mean, who wants to be an academic working in a university on something that you think is really interesting yes. and not actually sharing that in some way to make people think differently about that subject or the world or whatever? Of course it's, of course it's mm. good. Mm. Um, I think the sort of, um, you know, my daughter certainly has been on research projects where, you know, as, as, as soon as the project started, um, they think of the impact, and yes. you say, we haven't done the research yet. Yes, 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 And as I said, that's like my, <laughs> these grant applications I see. You know, uh, and I suppose, and this makes me sound my age, I, like, yeah, I feel a bit sorry for 
the young people at that mm. level. Mm. Um, because I, I think I was terribly lucky not to have made a TV programme until I was into my 50s. Oh. You know? Because it didn't matter very much. If it didn't go right, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wasn't... You know, I was old enough to shake myself down and just go back to my day job. Um, yes. And... Um, you know, I had, you know, when, you know, when there's nasty reactions, I had a certain resilience. Yes. Um, so I kind of think that for academics, you know, I know that there is this kind of, um, this image, you know, that what is wanted on television is glamorous young female donettes, you know. Yes. And, and I would tend to recommend to the young glamorous female donettes to wait a bit. Because yes. um, it's... I, you know, it's much easier when you don't care so much. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just coming on then to the the fame side of things, was it a, a conscious decision, Mary, that um, I, I actually want to do this? I want to take my communication to the next level, or did you sort of fall into it, or was it something in between? I or was. How did it happen? I was persuaded. Persuaded. Um, Really? <laughs> uh, quite cleverly. Yeah. There's a woman um, called Janice Hadlow, who is a historian, um, sort of partly in her spare time, but she writes good books. Uh, and she was controller of BBC Two. Oh. And she'd happened to read my Pompeii book on her holiday. And as controller of BBC Two, she was really keen on various things. One was getting more kind of you know, mature women mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. onto telly, and two, getting real historians and real experts to present mm -hmm. their programmes. So mm -hmm. I ticked two of her boxes. Yes. Um, when they asked me, I was, uh, my first instinct was to say no. <laughs> For a very simple reason. Um, that I knew Telly took an inordinately long time, you know, it takes like something like, you know, a month to make an hour's telly, you know, and that is really, you know, yeah. sitting around for ages and ages and sitting around while the cameramen go and photograph birds and things like this, and, you know, that kind of stuff. And I thought this is, you know, is that how I want to spend my time? And what Janice said was, look, and it was true, you're one of the people who have complained that women your age don't get on telly, that all these documentary uh, presenters mm. are craggy old historian men, <laughs> and that craggy historian females <laughs> don't make it onto telly. <laughs> now I'm offering you a telly programme. It's yes. a bit rich not to <laughs> accept. Yes. So yeah. I, so I, you know, I thought, oh God, I'm a snooker there, you know, yes. really money yes. where her mouth is. <laughs> one of my parting shots to her, Proved prophetic, however. I said, you know what? I don't think A.A. A. Gill will like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> yes, what a discerning chat. Yeah. <laughs> so again, maybe that brings us on to, so a lot of positives from being exposed to the media, a lot of positives. Um, again, thinking of people who are wondering about dipping a toe into that market from what you've learnt Mary and what you've experienced sort of words of wisdom to those thinking or setting out on this well yeah you've got to be prepared for the rough as well as the smooth you know and you know, you're not going to make a television program that everybody likes if you made a television program that everybody liked it would probably be a very boring one, you know <laughs> i mean if it's doing something a bit different people are not going somebody is not going to like it um i i mean that goes back really to what i was saying about being a bit older you know you have to be resilient you have to have a bit of a thick skin um if somebody like gill had said of me, had I made a telly programme when I was 25, not 55, saying words to the effect of, she looks like back into a bus, mm -hmm. I think I would have been very, very upset. Mm -hmm. As it was, I felt a little bit battered, um, but then I thought, what an idiot. Yes. You know, yes. what a real idiot. <laughs> but it takes quite a lot mm. of, you know, school of hard knocks to get to the point where you can say, what an idiot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think now looking back on all that, 
um, you know, from a general point of view, and I think this doesn't make too much difference to people wanting to put their toe in the water, I think it wasn't me, but the public reaction to Gill you know, where you know, the Daily yes. Mail were just as cross as The Guardian yes. about it. Yes. You know, he actually missed the public mood. Yes. And yes. everybody, it was a good moment uh, for everybody to say, that is just, you know, we want yes. telly to have different people in. We don't yes. want it all yes. to be um, people who are conventionally yes. gorgeous and yes. under 30 if they're yes. female. Yes. Uh, though you yes. can have as many people be <laughs> all men as you like. <laughs> Right? Yes. Um, and it sort of, I mean, okay, there were some people I'm sure, and I know, agreed with Gil, but by and large, every organ of the media yes. said that is not, not on. And that's, that was quite yes. good. I mean, yes. you know, perhaps one of, one would not necessarily have chosen oneself to be the prompt to no. that, <laughs> you know. But looking back, you know, yes. the profit and loss account came out right. Yes, yeah. And we're yeah, very grateful to you for not giving up and uh, trailblazing. Okay, one last daft question from me, and then uh, we'll, we'll throw this open to all of you. So, okay, hateful question. Tell us one thing, Mary, about yourself which we might not know. Oh, God. <laughs> no? oh, but I used you, to... Do you want to think about it, and we'll ask other questions? I can tell you. Oh, okay. I can tell you. We're listening. <laughs> Um, these, are, these are naughty habits. I used to be, I have to say, I, this is no longer the case. I used to be the world's biggest fan of Casualty and Holby City. Ah. <laughs> that is wicked. It, whichever way you want to use that Saturday word. Saturday <laughs> night, ca I mean, yes. casually before Holby City, yes. children in bed, or yes. even if not, <laughs> mum yes. in front of the telly, yes. you know exactly what the plot was going to be. <laughs> oh, you know, yes. They're yes. going to turn out to have Munchausen syndrome yes. by proxy yes. or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a yeah. bottle of wine. And a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, let's now please have some questions from my lovely audience. Yes. Please. Uh, and we have a roving mic, so if you could put your hand up and Mr. Roving Mike will come and find you. So. If not, I'll carry on with my daft questions. There we go. <laughs> that, that is, in a, you know, in one example, you know, the problem about women's history, isn't it? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm always slightly suspicious about um, those books that say, right, I'm now going to tell you all we know about Roman women, because actually we don't know much about Roman women, um, and it's perhaps not a good idea to pretend that we do. Yes. But, um, you know, the sense that we see history as, as male, apart from one or two isolated examples that come up in the middle, and we never think about mm. um, a, a, a history which is really ambidextrous. I think it's, it's absolutely striking. You know, most people can name Julius Caesar and the Emperor Nero, they'd struggle to name a Roman woman. So you're absolutely right, and I've just proved the point. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, please? How do I see research going in the light of Brexit? Um, I feel very despondent. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, during my lifetime, m my research has become effectively European, uh, and, uh, and it's been enhanced and enriched by that. Yeah, you know, I teach students from the EU, they come on equal terms, fee terms, that's important. Um, I have colleagues and collaborators within Europe, and I expect to have that. And it's a much more diverse, interesting, um, reflective world than it used to be. Now, you know, I don't want to knock uh, what was going on in my early career too much. Um, you know, we used to go to conferences and we'd go and <laughs> dig abroad and things like that. But we, we did think of Europe as separate from us. Uh, and now, I, in work terms, I don't think that. Um, and I, I worry that Brexit will 
close the borders down again. Now, the optimistic reading is that those kind of means of collaboration are now so unstructured that they will continue no matter what the politics is. Um, and I hope that's the case. Um, but I actually think that um, money is important in all this. And as we were talking before, I, I can't see as many, let's say, German students coming to my department to do their degree um, when the fees are doubled, when they're not coming at the, at, at the same rate as British students. And I think that that, that will be an impoverishment of our culture. But I'm hoping that it won't... Well, I'm sort of hoping that Brexit won't happen, really. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get that feeling? I mean, I wake up sometimes... You know, you wake up in the morning and you think, oh, actually, somebody will come to their set. You know, <laughs> this is going to go away. You know? <laughs> Another fingers. question? Yeah. No. <laughs> um, uh, it's slightly more complicated than that because um, the classical world was an even more misogynistic culture than ours. And one of the features of a misogynistic culture is that it's constantly seeing dangerous women everywhere. Because the way you justify your misogyny is to say, oh, look, you know, if you don't really hold the girls down, just look what they'll do. And you, so you have, you know, I don't know how many people here um, ever watched the BBC series of I, Claudius many a decade ago. But there, <laughs> Livia was the perfect example. Livia poisoned everybody. She finally gets rid of her husband, Augustus. Um, and people say, gosh, she was powerful. You know, no, she wasn't. All those stories were invented by the men, right? Say, so, oh, have to watch the women because they'll poison you, you know. So I, I think the short answer is no. no. Thank you. We have a question there, Joan. In terms of writing, I'm going to start with that first because it's more important than the telly, but I'll come on to the telly. i am currently got um, a period of leave to write a book about images of Roman emperors in the Renaissance and later, so I'm going out of my comfort zone and looking <laughs> at Titian and things like this. So that's what I'm doing for my day job. Um, on the telly, I'm making... Uh, I'm, doing two episodes of the upcoming uh, remake of Kenneth Clark's Civilization, mm -hmm. um, which has been broadened mm. and is now called Civilizations. You know? <laughs> so it's not just European. Yeah. And we're going to make a new Roman series. Uh, we're not quite sure what that's going to be about yet, but we're talking about it next week. Mm -hmm. Well, I think so, that's, yes. a, that's a lovely high note uh, to actually finish on um, because Mary's on a very tight schedule, much in demand, um, and obligations. So I think on behalf of all of us, let's really show how much we appreciated that. <laughs>